23 years ago today, 12 students and a teacher were killed at Columbine High School. How does our community heal from this kind of massive collective trauma? In this episode of the Story of Our Trauma podcast, Frank DeAngelis, the principal of Columbine High School, reflects back on the day of the shooting and its traumatic aftermath. He shares how this event has impacted him and his own family, as well as the community at large. Let's drop into the conversation. Frank, I'm so honored and pleased to bring you on to the program today. Um, you were the principal at Columbine High School. And uh, when the mass shooting happened, April 20th, 1999, this was really a time when there were no drills for school shootings. Um, take us back to that time in that era when um, fire drills were really pretty much the only thing that we had prepared for in schools? Well, thank you so much for having me on. And uh, yeah, just a little bit of background. I was at Columbine for, I was in my 20th year. I started back way back in 1979 and I was a social studies or history teacher and coached the assistant football head baseball coach. And then I had a tough decision to make whether or not to get into administration. I had someone come up and say, hey, do you ever think to be a, you wanted to be an administrator? And I said, why would I want to be one of them? And because I loved my kids. And that's the thing I loved about education. And I was so concerned that if I did become an administrator, I would lose touch. And a dear friend of mine came to me and she said, Frank, let me share something with you. She said, your position is changing, but you don't have to change as a person. And think of the impact now. You're working with 150 kids in your social studies classes throughout the week. In coaching, but now you're going to have an opportunity to work with 2,000 kids and 150 staff members. So in 1996, I made the leap and I became principal at Columbine High School. And it, it just a fantastic school. And it, that family atmosphere, I mean, the graduation rate, fantastic. Kids go on to college, a lot of parental support. And I was just, everything was just wonderful. I said, I truly am blessed because I had an uncle tell me, choose a job you love and you never have to work a day in your life. Mm -hmm. And boy, did I choose the right job because to me, it wasn't a job. And, you know, I had people tease me and saying, Frank, why would you want to be an educator and live in a state of poverty for the rest of your life? And (laughs) they weren't too far (laughs) off because my first contract was uh, $10,000 and I was coaching three sports. But what I tell people is when kids come up to you and say, Mr. D, thanks for listening to me when no one else did, or thanks for being a parent to me when my parents were not there for me. And every year, my wife and I get invited eight or nine weddings. You can't put a price tag on that. There's other forms of wealth than financial affluence. And that connection that you had in your community was... Um, a form of wealth for you and the school you describe, the atmosphere you describe is not the kind of school that one might profile as being at risk for this kind of a mass casualty event. That's exactly right. And I know when I go out and I tell people this, if you would have told me prior to April 20th, 99, that a Columbine could happen at Columbine, I would have said no. Mm-hmm. It happened yep. place. And I know when I reach out to all these other communities in the aftermath, whether it be Sandy Hook, Virginia Tech Park, when the first thing they say, I can't believe it happened here. Yeah. Well, all of a sudden, I'm near the end of my third year as principal, 20 year at Columbine in April 20th, 1999 comes about a day in which my life changed forever. I mean, it was a beautiful Colorado spring day, blue skies, but there were some things that happened that day that are just kind of crazy. Usually I'm at school every morning at six o'clock in the morning, but that day I was out of the building because some of our students were receiving awards by the Chamber of Commerce. So I wanted to go to support them. So I get to school late. And the reason I'm sharing this is because um, usually every day out of 170 days, we meet with our kids. I was downstairs in a cafeteria. I was one of the high school principals that loved cafeteria duty because I got to be with my kids in an informal setting. Well, that day I was not, and I was late getting back to school. And I was going to meet with the teacher to offer him a job because uh, I had interviewed him the day before and he was just fantastic. And I couldn't find him. So as a result, he walks into my office just as I'm getting ready to go downstairs to a lunch. And so we sit down 
And all of a sudden, my secretary comes in, and I knew something was wrong because my door was shut, and she's face planted. And I knew something when she opened the door, and she said, Frank, there's been a report of gunfire and bombs exploding. And in my mind, I'm saying this can't be happening. In my 20 years, the only, I could count on two hands the number of fistfights we had. So this was not registering. And it's funny, to this day, the teacher I was with, I don't know if we ever signed or offered him a contract and he's still working at Columbine. But before we could have that conversation, I ran out of my office and, and I thought, and this is where the mind started playing funny games in my mind. I thought I walked out very calmly and in actuality, I sprinted towards a gunman and I've had law enforcement agents say, Frank, why would you sprint towards a gunman? One reason and one reason only my kids were in trouble. Yep. And uh, there were about 25 of my girls that were coming out of the locker room to go to a physical education class, and they were unaware. And so they were right in the crossfires, mm-hmm. the gunman coming towards us. Now, back in the day, the only drills we did in Colorado in 1999 were fire drills. And mm-hmm. we didn't right. do some of the drills that our kids were teaching from a very early age, whether it be lockdowns and things of that nature. But I also knew that I knew the 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 building and how the doors and exits and things of that nature. And I knew if I could get the girls into a gym, into the gym, there were doors outside that would get us to a safe place. Well, everything was going as well. I'm trying to keep the girls calm. And all of a sudden I pull on the gym door and it's locked and the girls are screaming, uh, you know, Papa D say, what are we going to do? And some girls started praying and we could literally hear the shots being fired the sounds of the shots getting louder we hear the boots because the gunman was wearing boots we could hear the boots getting closer girls are screaming and i literally had about 25 keys on a key ring 25 to 35 keys on a key ring and i had a suit on that day and i reached in my pocket the first key i stuck in the door it opened it on the first try Mm. and i what i tell people when i go out and speak when what i learned later from behavioral scientists and others they're saying you're, when you're under a state of uh, stress, mm-hmm. your fine motor skills are diminished and everything seems to slow down. And for you to find that key was truly remarkable. So the, you know, a teaching moment is if there is something that you need to get to quickly, yeah. make sure that you have that access. Right. And, you know, this is an era when it wasn't just surreal for you that there was a gunman in Columbine. It was, it would have been surreal for any educator or leader in any school because this was a time when none of us were prepared or even had a mental image of this possibility. It was the first of really a traumatic shift, I think, in our society where we all became aware of the possibility that schools could be a place um, where our kids could be targeted. Um, And this experience, you got a call from a friend of yours who was a Vietnam veteran the day after this uh, school shooting. Can you tell us about that call? Sure. It was probably one of the most important calls I received because what happens when you go through a traumatic experience and being a principal or being a leader or whatever the case may be, you feel the need to take care of everyone else. Mm -hmm. And the last person you take care of is yourself. Mm -hmm. And I was in that position. I mean, I just, all I kept thinking about is these kids And Mr. Sanders, who was the teacher that was killed, walked into the school at 7 a.m. and they never returned home. Mm -hmm. And I felt this huge burden, this survivor's guilt. And John, this chiropractor whom I worked for, called and he said, Frank, I'm going to give you some advice. He said, I, you know, fought in Vietnam. I never got the help I needed. And I'm struggling. You know, we talk about flashbacks. We talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, but I never got that help. And all of a sudden, he said, you need to find the help because it personally, it cost me a marriage, it cost me in business opportunities and things. If I can offer anything to you, if you don't hear anything else, please hear me, get that support system you need. And that was probably one of the most important things for me because I did get into counseling Mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. And what it did is also planted in my mind that I could share that story with my staff and people because no one, when you, 
in my humble opinion, when people go through a traumatic experience, they feel their lives are out of control. Just like that day, right. parents are right. thinking, oh my gosh, we thought schools were safe or parent. You go through this. And the last thing people want to be told is what to do. And, and I learned early on, if I would have went into my staff or the kids or the parents and said, boy, you people are messed up. You better talk to someone. Mm -hmm. They're going to say, I'm not listening. What is he? But it's how I shared the message. Right. At the aftermath. Well, you, said, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. You cleared the space for them as a leader to be able to go and talk through their own experience. You know, everybody, as, as you have said to me, can have the same trauma, but have a different response to it. On the day of that trauma, you acted out of instinctive love for those girls. And you did something that didn't make logical sense. You put your life in danger because that love impelled you to put yourself between the gunman and those girls. But I've also had many of my patients and friends and um, contacts tell me that trauma has changed their personality. And that's something I heard you resonate with. Can you talk about how the trauma changed your personality? It was different. There was so much survivor's guilt. Uh, as I stated, you, uh, those kids, I mean, they're 14, 15 years old kids and they're dying. And Mr. Sanders, who was one of my dearest friends and a mentor and at his wedding, and we used to meet every morning before school for coffee in my office. If he didn't come out of the social or out of the faculty lounge, I would have died because what happened is the gunman stopped momentarily to shoot Mr. Sanders as he was heading towards me and the girls. So there's all this survivor's guilt. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know anything about it. I was numb. I was literally numb. But I can remember as time went on and I started speaking to counselors and doing things like this, what really changed for me is when I was in front of people, I had this adrenaline flowing. And I was working, you know, 15 hours a day and sleeping very little. And I had so much adrenaline going. But then when I had any time to myself, I wanted to be alone. And, and one of the things that I share now is you're, you're being pulled in so many different directions. But where I really, really dropped the ball is with my family. Because I got the help I needed and I got into counseling and I wish I would have been more persistent with my wife. And my daughter saying, hey, because my wife said to me, she said, you're not the man I married. And I wasn't. That event changed me. And I wish when I said you need to come in and, you know, mm -hmm. the doctor, the psychologist could explain to you why I don't want to be around people, why I don't want to be around family, why I have a difficult time looking at someone eye to eye because of this guilt. And she said, no, you're I'm not the one messed up. You are. And I wish I would have been more persistent because as time went on. Over the three years in dealing with this, we grew apart and unfortunately went through a divorce. So that's one of the things that's so important when you go through this. You're having it has its effect on you, but thinking back to your loved ones when they're whether it be the parents of the kids, the spouses of the uh, staff members, when their word came out, shots were fired at Columbine High School, their hearts started racing because they weren't sure if you were ever going to walk through that door again. And so I think it's important yeah. to be able to include other people in this journey. Well, I'm so glad you made that connection between that trauma of survivor's guilt and your family system. Because as I've written about in my book, Warrior, survivor's guilt is a very interesting and challenging kind of trauma. It's a moral injury that is social in nature. It is often um, boiling down to who am I that was worthy to survive when others that were so worthy have been killed. Um, and this happens, you know, across trauma events, but the, um, the healing for this has to be social, communal, relational, because the nature of that wound is social, communal, relational about one's worth and, um, you know, the fact that one survived when others didn't. So i um, like to take a short break right now. And we've talked about how you felt, you know, numb. Uh, and then there was this adrenaline rush with the work you're doing. And we'll, we'll drop back there uh, in just a couple minutes. You can break the barriers of mental health. Given Hour's mission is to provide help and hope to those in need. 
As of 2021, Given Hour's volunteer network of mental health providers has delivered over 360,000 hours of barrier-free, no-cost mental health care. With a small gift of $5, you can give help and hope. Your generosity will allow Given Hour to deliver confidential mental health services and vital education tools. Thank you for your support because mental health is just as important as our physical health. Visit www.givenhour.org to learn more or to donate. Okay, and we're back with Frank DeAngelis. Um, we were talking about the day of the Columbine shooting and the aftermath and that trauma impact uh, for Frank. And he talked about feeling numb at first and at the same time having this rush of adrenaline, you know, really going into overdrive and doing a lot of media work and, and work with his community and trying to support them and then feeling like he just wanted to be isolated at home. And that's a biological thing. You know, that makes sense if you've got this adrenaline rush, you're going to have a corresponding adrenaline dump or crash. So there's a strong biological reason, but he didn't have the kind of um, support at the time to really help his family understand that. And it feels like he lost his family because of that inability to really help them understand how trauma had changed him. So I'd like to jump back into the conversation now and ask you about you know, when the numbness faded, when did you start to feel angry and angry at God? When did you notice that? Well, just a little bit of background. I was a person of faith, a uh, cradle Catholic. And that night when I went home and we couldn't even go back to our house because the FBI was concerned about the safety and welfare of my family. And so I was able to go home and get a change of clothes for my family and myself. And we went to my brother and sister-in-law's house. And as I'm sitting there, I was just reliving everything that I had witnessed that day, something I was never prepared for. And I was angry. And I kept thinking, you know, God, how could you allow this to happen? What I witnessed that day with kids being shot, pools of blood, things of that nature. And I was angry for the first time in my life towards God. And it was a couple of days later that Father Ken, who was a pastor down at the church where I had been a member for the 20 years I had been at Columbine, he said, Frank, you need to come down. I said, Father, I have nothing to give. I, I said, I just can't. He knew something. He said, please, Frank, just come down. And we're going to do kind of a prayer vigil. And so I reluctantly went down to the church on Tuesday evening, which would have been the 22nd. And I walk into the church and there's probably about 1,200 people in the sacristy, but he calls me up on the altar and he has some of my students who were part of the youth group up there and some of my staff members. And he whispered something in my ear. He said, Frank, you should have died that day. God's got a plan. And he said, many times blessings are really, di or difficulties are really blessings in disguise. Then he quoted Proverbs. He said, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. And he said, it's going to be a tough journey and you're going to fall. But remember, you don't have to travel that journey alone. And the thing that still resonates with me almost 23 years later is he said, Frank, no one knows why God chose you other than God, but you're going to have to rebuild that community and it's going to be a tough task. And as these events happen in future years, you're going to be there to speak to them because when you state, I know what you're feeling, you'll be able to bond with those people. And as a result of that, that's why I continue to do it in my faith was important to me. And I guess the key point for anyone who's listening is you need to find that support system. You never have to travel that journey alone in my faith, along with counseling, along with my family, really prepared me to carry out what Father had asked me to do on April 22nd of 2000, or 1999. You know, when my friend recommended that I reach out and see if you would interview, she said, you're really going to like him. And I, I walked in faith that that would be the case. And I think the thing that she saw that I'm just putting words to now is the way you responded throughout on the day of and afterwards is the way a warrior responds. I don't believe that warriorship is just about combat operations. Warriors to me are people that are willing to do things other people wouldn't do and take risks in the service of the people and values they hold sacred. 
And so when I think about your process of walking through this trauma, you've actually navigated it like a warrior would, based on my experience with, with our warfighters. And the, one of the hardest things that, you know, I want us to kind of talk about for a minute is how do you reconcile being that protector of the people that you love, holding that rage about what happened and trying to figure out how to forgive, resolve, make peace with the gunman. Um, that is a really tricky thing. So I'd like to ask you about your relationship emotionally um, and sort of um, theoretically with the gunman who caused all of this trauma and suffering. Well, that's a wonderful question and something I've had to deal with. Um, the thing that was so upsetting to me is the narrative that was painted after the tragedy and how they described these two killers. And that was not accurate. What I saw these two killers, the two gunmen, were students that were not, uh, you know, these kids that are at risk, kids that were living on the edge. These were kids that were at prom the Saturday night before uh, the mm. shooting occurred. They're high-fiving me, Mr. D, how you doing? They're dancing. They're having a great time. They come to Columbine after prom. And in their minds, they know in three days, many of those kids that were prom could have died because their intent was not to come into the building and shoot kids. Their intent was to blow up the school. They placed two propane tanks. And fortunately, those bombs did not explode. But I'm thinking these are cold-hearted killers. And I can remember in the days following, it was so difficult. I had so much hate and anger. And mm -hmm. and you know, the five stages of grief and originally, you know, you're in denial, but then that anger phase steps in and I was there and people came up and said, Frank, what is going on? You're mad, you're angry, you're short with us. What is going on? And, and I kept thinking about it and a young, a T kid who was just phenomenal. It was Patrick Ireland and he was the boy in the window mm -hmm. and he saw any of the videotape and I used to go visit those kids that were critically injured at Craig Hospital. And we were talking one day and he said, Mr. D, I got to share something with you. Now, mind you, this is a 50 or a 17 year old kid. And he said, you know something, Mr. D, he said, I can't start healing until I forgive. Mm. And that was an eye opener. And then I was struggling and sharing some of my thoughts with some of my close friends. And a, a dear friend of mine sent me something. He said, Frank, I want you to think about this. He said, think of what God says. You can hate the sin, but love the sinner or forgive the sinner. And my life changed as a result of that. I could never forgive the act. Right. You know, having to attend 13 memorial services no. in kids that were not only physically injured, but mentally injured. But I could not allow that to be pent up inside because my greater mission was to help rebuild that community. My greater mission was to help others. And that really helped me in seething. And then one other thing, if I can share that, mm -hmm. that was a changing point for me with the mental aspect, I, uh, we did not go back to Columbine to finish the year. We had about a month left, but our building was in uh, shambles. But I had to report back to school as a principal right after uh, 4th of July of 99. And I walked in and that's when I realized what post-traumatic stress was. Uh, when I walked in, unfortunately, well, for, uh, unfortunately, there was a lot of construction going on. So loud sounds, whether it be, mm -hmm. you know, pounding, I would have flashbacks to those gun sounds. Uh, when I walked out of my office at times, I'd come down the hallway and I'd be in that hallway and I'd see that gunman coming towards me. And I would just break down and cry and I'd run out of school. Yeah. And this went on for several days. And I called my counselor. I said, we need to meet. I don't know if I can continue doing this. I'm having all these memories and flashbacks. Right. And he said, do me a favor. And I said, okay. He said, tell me something about Lauren Townsend. She was one of the students that died. And I said, I've known her since she was a little girl. Her mom and I used to be in the gym together when we were coaching. Okay. And I remember, tell me about Isaiah Scholes. He used to high five me every day and tell me about Rachel Scott. And she, I remember her being on the stage and on and on and on. 
And he said, Frank, what I need for you to do, and this is where we need to change that mindset, that if every time you walk in here and you walk out of your office into that hallway and you see those shots being fired, you see those kids lying in a pool of blood, I can assure you, your career at Columbine is over. Mm -hmm. But if you walk out and change that mindset and not mourn their death, but celebrate their lives, you have a chance to rebuild this community and be a part of that. And uh, that was life changing for me. Well, that is very important, I think, to really draw that distinction. So if we think about you know, the difference between grief and trauma, trauma is something where we're locked in that loop of helplessness and horror. And one of the key indicators from trainings I've done for the NFL Foundation is around how if some of the last images that we think of with a person who has passed are those graphic images, then that suggests that we are still trapped within that trauma loop. Uh, Grief is different. Grief is about love. Grief is about holding that love and moving forward with that love and keeping those people close to us, those students close, Isaiah, Rachel, you know, those students, Lauren, close in our heart and, um, you know, hearing their voice and, and holding that love as we walk forward. So those are two very different things. And uh, it sounds like you had a really insightful therapist if uh, he or she was able to really see that. Um, I want to go back just for a second because it's it's a hard thing to explain to people, um, much harder to do than to say even, about helping people understand that piece about forgiveness not being acceptance of an evil, evil thing, or not making it okay that this happened. but how sometimes the path to healing requires us to walk through that space of trying to separate the person from the act and how you can explain that to other people because they will react with understandably often with with rage that it's not just all sort of seen as evil person, evil deed, no forgiveness, um, because it's a hard distinction to make. Can you share some more insights on that process? That was so difficult, and especially with the families who lost yeah. their kids. Yeah. And I can remember, and, and there were people that, you know, when they were there and they came up to me and they said, Frank, with all due respect, I could never forgive the gunman because they took my child. Yeah. And, it, and, and where I look at this is I'm not here to judge. I looked at what helped me and everyone. And I know there's even been some of the families uh, loved ones who lost their kids that forgave and other families could never do that. Yeah. And for me, that was what helped me with my road to healing. And, and that's one of the things that was an eye opener for me. And I see it, you know, happening on a continuous basis. I've seen it happen the past few years with the pandemic is that we could all experience the same event, but how we deal with it, we deal with it differently. Yeah. And for example, there were people that said, Frank, we need to talk about it. We need to talk in small groups, large groups. We need to have this. And other people said, as soon as I get back to doing what I was doing prior to the event happening, that's going to help me heal. And so I think that's the important thing that not one size fits all. That's right. That's right. And I think the other thing, and I know you deal with this all the time, that so many times people feel that they're the only ones experiencing the, uh, the mental anguish or some of the things in all of a sudden, when you open up and I started sharing, I don't know about you, but you know, I'm not sleeping. My heart is racing. I'm thinking mm-hmm. I'm having a heart attack. I see people nodding their heads saying, geez, I'm having the same thing. So it's that communication, being able to talk and the difficult ones are the ones that no matter what you try, they just, they're not going to say anything and they're just going to be there in that grief they keep inside. And you just hope that they can come to terms or get the help that they need. You worry about them because while there is no one right way to grieve and people don't have to forgive, they don't have to, they need to go through their own path in their own timing. Um, It is also true that trauma has this deeply biological impact. And one of the things, you know, I wanted to talk about is this anniversary impact of trauma that affects a whole community around when that date comes up. And maybe you could share some insights on how to navigate the pain of that anniversary trauma. 
right. And I'll tell you, I had staff members tell me that they said, Frank, we wish the calendar would go from March 31st to May 1, because as we got closer to April, things started changing and this anxiety continued and their blood pressure went up and things of this nature because there was constant reminders. Now, a changing point for us that really helped because, and I never made any of these decisions on my own. I consulted the families who lost kids, the injured, even in the aftermath for many years. And we did remembrance every year for the first three years. And what it did is it did create anxiety. And that's one of the things that I share with other people that go through similar events. What do you do not to do? What worked and did not? And we did want to play, pay homage to those all the people who lost their lives and impacted. But what really changed for us was the fifth year anniversary. And Don Anna, who is the mother of Lauren Townsend, said, Frank, let's talk about doing something different. I said, I am all ears. She said, right now, all we know all the people know around this, you know, the school around this country, around the world, are these kids are the ones that lost their life, Mr. Sanders, but they didn't know anything about them. Mm. And so we literally put together mm. a video where the parents had footage of their kids growing up. And so it changed. Oh, that's it. cool. And yeah. it was and at, at our memorial, we had this montage and it was a celebration of life. And that was life changing for our community. Telling those stories. I spent three years of my career at Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, working with people who had lost loved ones in sudden, unexpected, traumatic ways. And it was so important at our gatherings to give space and make time for those names to be shared. But beyond just sharing the names, to share the stories about who these people are and how that love will be carried forward. And Um, how they lived so that their lives are not reduced to one tragic or traumatic death. Um, So that is a really, that's a wonderful gift. And I'd like you to give people the gift of sharing a very concrete strategy you've used to ground yourself when for you, that anniversary effect hits because you consult with other schools and leadership uh, when there are mass casualty events and you need to have these kinds of skills. Can you share uh, some specific guidance for, for folks on how you ground yourself? Well, one of the things I do is um, I call all the families on the day, April 20th. And first few years, people picked up. And, but as time went on, one of the things that helps me is last year, in calling the families, not all the families pick up because each person deals with it differently, but there were about eight of the eight or nine of the families that picked up. And I was on the phone for two hours talking about their kids and their lives. Mm-hmm. And that was life changing for me, just saying, gosh, they, we were laughing instead of crying. You know, and uh, one of the parents, Kyle Velasquez's parents, Phyllis and, um, Al Velasquez came in one day and they said, Frank, let's cry because we lost him, but smile because we had him. Yeah. So that's one of the things that I do. And one of the things that I do is I tell people what they need to do, but I need to practice what I preach. And every year I go in for maintenance with my, I have the same counselor that I had Mm -hmm. 23 years ago. And every April he calls and I go down and we just check in. And we talk and he walks me through to make sure, you know, and we talk about different things that may arise. And there's times where certain events come up in my own life that I call them more frequently. But I think so many times there's a stigmatism out there that if you seek counseling or, uh, you know, crisis management, it's a sign of weakness. And I tell people, no, it's not. It's a sign of strength. You know, I'll... uh, I've been in six different car accidents in the month of April, and that happened early on in this trip, which is a marathon and not a sprint. And I realized that come April, my mind, I was distracted. I wasn't concentrating. And I realized that I really needed to continue to get help. And, you know, and the other thing I need to share, and we talk about all the positive help that's out there with me. It was my faith, it's counseling. But unfortunately, there were days early on that it was very easy for me to go down in the basement with a glass of whiskey mm-hmm. to help cope. 
And I realized early on, this wasn't the way to get the help I needed. And unfortunately, I think we saw that. I really worried about my kids and staff members after, because I had kids telling me, I said, what are you doing this risk behavior? And I said, Mr. D, there's no guarantees in life. We just buried three of our best friends. So we're going to live life to the fullest. Mm. And that's where it's very difficult to walk these kids through on healthy ways to take care of yourself because you're not going to wake up some morning and everything's going to be back to normal. Yeah. And and there's that, yeah. no going back to the old way of seeing the world, seeing yourself. Trauma splits our lives into two pieces. Um, and there's so much in what you're saying that I don't want to lose. So there's, you know, this stigma attached to getting a good doc in your life. But, you know, as a doc, I think it's wisdom actually to have someone you trust in place for the challenges that come up. You don't want to be figuring that out. Can I find somebody I can trust to walk me through this valley when you're in the valley? Um, and so having that in place and, and being proactive about knowing that there's going to be this anniversary effect. Uh, you had also shared in our other conversations that when you get called in for other consultation and you get triggered, you ground yourself by holding on to something tangible and physical and telling yourself, this is not April 20th, 1999. This is, I'm not there in that place. Um, and then I think I also heard you say you've shifted from just kind of remembering the the kids that were killed to calling and having these conversations with their parents about who they are. And I think that's something I really want to highlight for people that people who are in grief are craving that connection with people they trust to say, tell me about your loved one. Let's talk about them. Let's reconnect with them. And what we tend to do in our society is, is withdraw when someone is in grief. We don't want to say the wrong thing or we don't know how to handle it. So we tend to withdraw, but what they need from us is exactly what you have given to them every year is you advance into that relationship and you say, let's talk about your loved one and let's take all the time we need to remember. And there can be joy and there can be laughter and grief that co-mingle together in that sacred space of really honoring the life of that loved one. Um, is there anything I said that you'd revise or? You know, oh, no, it was wonderful, you know, and I think that's so important and something that you just touched upon that is, I think, really important is so many times when these events happen, you don't know, you don't know what words to use. And I think a lot of times, sometimes just sitting back and not saying anything, right. what we learn is there are certain triggers. If I was to go up to them and say, gosh, I know what you're feeling. And they're saying, mm -hmm. you do? Yeah. You bury your child? And, no. and, so, and I think a lot of times, and the other thing that I found a lot of times when I go out and do presentations or even, you know, after events, a lot of times the people, the parents who were needed consoling become the consolers. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that help with the healing that they're talking to these people. People come up and, you know, we're so sorry, but by the end of the conversation, they're consoling the people that were there to try to console the parents and others of the victims, so to speak. I've seen that too, you know, and there's a lot of fear about saying the wrong thing, but there's also things that nobody should say, you know, that we really should weed out of our responses. Like, I know what you're feeling or, um, you know, I, I can identify, I can resonate. Everybody's response is different. And to your point, not saying anything, but I love you and I'm here for you. Um, and depending on where people are, do you want to talk about anything? Talk about, we can talk about your loved one. I loved them too. Um, giving them that space, but allowing them to lead in that relationship as they walk that valley of grief. And we're just walking with them and kind of following their cues, I think is so important. So um, gosh, we could talk for a lot longer than we have today, but Thank you for coming on and sharing from your heart and from your experience with helping this community navigate this communal trauma that also had great personal costs for you, Frank. Um, I really appreciate your continuing mission for other people that have gone through this unthinkable tragedy um, and tragedies like this. So um, thank you. 
Thank you very much. Any closing thoughts before we end? No, thank you. And uh, I greatly appreciate the opportunity. And, you know, and one of the things I say all the time, I refuse to be helpless. I refuse to be hopeless and I refuse to give in. And I'm going to continue to do this. If I can help one other person, that's important because just like that Vietnam veteran was there for me, I'm going to be there for people. And we're all, they're all of our kids. And we're going to do everything in my power to make sure that my beloved 13 did not die in vain. Well, you may not be a conventional warrior like the Vietnam veteran friend you mentioned or the combat veterans I serve, but that is exactly how warriors think about trauma is I'm not going to give up and I'm going to help other people. If I just can help one brother or sister or loved one, um, that's enough for me. So thank you so much. How do we heal from traumatic grief? Our prevailing cultural script tells us to commemorate those who have died. How many times have we been urged to remember those fallen through a moment of silence? Maybe what we really need to heal is not silence or commemoration, but rather to find our voices and express their stories. Maybe we need to go beyond just speaking their names. Maybe we need to expand into who they are, what they loved, and how they lived. Frank DeAngelis has paid a terrible price in the aftermath of Columbine. And at the same time, he has deep insight into how we can change our understanding of how to heal through a different expression of our collective grief. Post-traumatic stress is not a life sentence. Trauma can be healed with the right insights, the right treatments, and the right support. The story of our trauma is presented by Stella. Visit www.stellacenter.com to learn more about Stella's breakthrough trauma treatments. Please share this episode with people you care about who have been impacted by trauma. And remember to subscribe on Spotify and other streaming platforms.